Uh, well, good evening, and welcome to St. Silas this evening, uh, particularly if you're joining us for the very first time. Uh, my name is James. I'll give us a bit of a steer through the service tonight, uh, so you're in safe hands, and uh, hopefully we should have a good time uh, together. Uh, this evening's uh, slightly different to what we normally do. Normally we'll, we'll sing a song and we'll have a prayer and we'll have a Bible reading and a preach, uh, but this evening we have a guest preacher uh, in our bishop. Bishop Andy will be preaching for us uh, this evening from Matthew's Gospel a little later. Well, I wonder how you feel about good news. And uh, a couple of years ago, more than a couple of years ago, when I was growing up, I remember my best Christmas present I ever had. And it was a sparkling, shiny new blue bike. And it was one of those bikes where you cycle backwards and it breaks uh, as in it doesn't break, break, but it slows you down. Uh, and it was such good news that I immediately, upon getting it, I raced around to my, all my friends' houses. And I cycled outside and I did donuts outside uh, their houses, ringing the bell and saying, look at my new bike. Uh, look at my new bike. Uh, well, the Christian gospel is a message about good news. Uh, and it's a message to be proclaimed and declared and to be told uh, to our friends. Uh, so right at the end of Matthew's Gospel that we'll look at a bit later, uh, we read of Jesus' death, uh, his crucifixion, his death, uh, his burial, and then his resurrection and ascension. And then afterwards, just before he's ascended, uh, Jesus says these words to his disciples. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so he's, Jesus is commanding us uh, to tell the good news of his death, resurrection, and ascension to all our friends, uh, neighbors, everywhere. Uh, so as we start, let me pray for us uh, for our service tonight. Uh, Father, we thank you for this good news uh, of Jesus. We thank you for sending him. And we pray uh, that tonight we'll hear about that good news, uh, that our hearts will be warmed, and uh, then that we'll be challenged uh, to tell our friends and neighbors this good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, well, in our very first song uh, this evening, uh, we got that brilliant line about Jesus that we have been ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. And the outworking of this is that, therefore, we praise him. Uh, we praise the King of Heaven. So I'm going to hand over to Greg and the band now, and they'll lead us in our first song. Thank you. 
Lose the wind and it is gone But while mortals rise and perish God endures unchanging on Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him Praise the High Eternal One Great. Thanks, Greg and the band there. Uh, well, in a moment, Simon is going to read for us uh, a passage from Matthew, and then afterwards, uh, we're going to l- uh, watch an interview uh, that I had with Andy earlier this week. Maybe you've never met Andy uh, before, so I spent a bit of time catching up with Andy and Mandy uh, at home this week. And then after that, Andy's going to preach to us. Our reading is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. That's Matthew chapter 9 verses 35 to 38. I'll give you a second to find that. Matthew chapter 9 starting at verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Well, good afternoon, uh, Martin, and indeed all at uh, St. Silas. As I said earlier in the interview, I'm sorry not to be with you in person. But as we come to his word now, let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we pray that today, in accordance with the the Lord's Prayer, to give us today our daily bread. So please feed us with what we need for the next day, not just physically, but also spiritually from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The um, British Association of Behavioural and Cognitive Psychotherapies, B-A-B-C-P for short, are, along with uh, others, trying to help their members involved in counselling to deal with the traumas associated with COVID-19. I quote, Being a professional involved in delivering talking therapies is a fantastic career with huge personal satisfaction that can come from connecting with and helping others. It can also be stressful and challenging at times, especially in the face of cuts to services and other systemic stresses. It is important to look after yourself in order to be able to look after others, just like on uh, the flight where you are instructed, uh, if you remember what it was like to fly, where you're instructed by uh, the, the usually the uh, video to um, put your own oxygen mask on first before attempting to help someone else on the plane. And uh, this uh, British Association of Behavioural and Cognitive Psychotherapies uh, goes on to talk of the language of compassion, which is empathy for another's suffering and a desire to alleviate it. Uh, He goes on to compassion fatigue, which is the gradual lessening of compassion 
over time due to repeated demands. Then there are words like secondary trauma, burnout and self-care. Well, there's much that is helpful in what they say, not just for professionals, but indeed for all people, not least during this COVID-19 pandemic. We're confronted now, not just with the daily tragedies of people living elsewhere in the world and which they face much more regularly, so it seems, than we ourselves, but how much closer to home now with a daily diet of statistics of care home deaths and deprived areas of, of Clydeside with, where there's a much higher incidence of death rates, of heart-wrenching stories of not being able to be with loved ones in their final days, nor perhaps to attend in any numbers uh, their funerals. And Christians are not immune to this stress. Well, the Lord Jesus in our passage in uh, Matthew chapter 9 faced unparalleled stress as being both fully the omnipotent creator God, who was able to alleviate all suffering, yet simultaneously fully human, without the luxury of being able to be whisked away in a helicopter from the crowds once he'd done his bit. You see, since the end of the Sermon on the Mount in uh, chapters 5 to 7, Matthew records Jesus' remarkable, miraculous activities, chapters 8 and 9. Just looking through them, there was a, a leper cleansed by Jesus. Uh, he healed the centurion's servant at a distance. Peter's mother-in-law had uh, her fever got rid of. He went about healing all, driving out demons calmed the storm on the sea. He released demon-possessed men. He calmed the storm on the sea. Sorry, I've already said that. <laughs> Forgiving and healing the paralysed man. He transformed Matthew himself, the tax collector. He raised a dead girl. He healed a sick woman. He restored sight to the blind and speech to the mute. Isn't that remarkable? Certainly the people in Galilee at the time said nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. Imagine some like, someone like that here and able to deal with COVID-19 with just a word. And yet he faced... A remarkable response. The Gentiles, we're told in chapter 8, verse 34, pleaded with him to leave. The Pharisees, in chapter 9, verse 34, said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. And even his own disciples do not trust him. Just look at chapter 8, verse 26. Well, in this wonderful little passage in Matthew, how does Jesus respond? Verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. There were hundreds of towns in Galilee with thousands of people. And he goes about amongst them all, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Matthew then goes on to describe why Jesus did this, despite the rejection that I've already pointed out to us. So we see there the heart of Jesus. That's why he did it, the heart of Jesus. But we then see what he wants his followers, like us, to do. The part played by Jesus' followers. So the heart and the part. And that will be a model for us as we look out at 21st century Greater Glasgow. 
So first, the heart of Jesus, verse 36. Listen to it again. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When he saw the crowds, he had, it says, compassion. That is a word which means literally gut-wrenching. In this sense of compassion, it is only ever used in the New Testament of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, although I have to say that the same word or the same root word is used of Judas in Acts chapter 1 when he, having betrayed the Lord Jesus, uh, fell headlong, bursting open in the middle. And as the Bible puts it in delightful terms in verse 18 of chapter 1 of Acts, all his guts gushing out. <laughs> well, that pity, the pity of the master in the parable of the unforgiving servant, is also the same word, but this time referring to Jesus and his compassion for the servant who um, owed him an unpayable debt, Matthew 18. Well, why such compassion in the face of rejection? Well, it's because of how he saw the crowd. Look with me at verse 36. They were, he said, harassed and helpless, like an exhausted animal, pursued perhaps by a pack of jackals or dogs, and it collapses, exhausted. Helpless is also a strong word, meaning cast down, and it's used of, in fact, um, the 30 pieces of silver that were cast, thrown down by Judas in the temple, the price that he put on the Lord Jesus. It is a picture of an animal at the very end of its tether, utterly helpless and hopeless. Secondly, notice he describes them as being like sheep without a shepherd. Well, sheep, as we probably often hear, is not a complimentary term. Sheep are stupid and dirty. They are easily lost, damaged and vulnerable to predators. But it is a rich term with Old Testament background. You see, Moses asked for a successor shepherd in Joshua to look after and lead the people of Israel. Israel in exile later on is described as like sheep without shepherd. Even before the exile, we hear about the shepherds and the promised rescue of the sheep. Listen uh, to uh, Ezekiel chapter 34 and verses 11 to 16. You see the Lord acted um, against the shepherds who were themselves acting and looking after themselves at the expense of the sheep. And it says this in verses 11 to 16. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel. Will uh, uh, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land, I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and make them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. So the Lord there promising to rescue his sheep. And then in verses 22 to 24 of the same chapter, I will save my flock 
and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David. He's referring there to the Messiah, to the Christ, the one who would come, the one who would be the good shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. See, God would rescue this scattered, helpless, harassed sheep through his Messiah. And he would do all that a good shepherd would do for his sheep. You, may, you will remember the uh, very famous words of Psalm 23. The sheep will lack nothing. They will lie down in green pastures. The shepherd will lead them beside still waters. He will refresh their soul. And of course, in the New Testament, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. So he sees the crowds in this way, and that produces a shepherd's instinct of pity and compassion, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Love is the motivator, and Jesus had come to offer the kingdom of heaven and making that available through what he achieved by his death on the cross. That was why he came. And that's why he continued in spite of rejection. If we are his people, we should share something of his love. So as we look out at Greater Glasgow, where the Lord has placed you, you will see all kinds of things. COVID-19, deprivation and so on. But you will also see that unless they out there and you perhaps have Jesus as their or your shepherd, then they or you will face an eternity without him. Out of compassion it was that Jesus acted as he did. When he was lifted up on the cross, he made it possible to draw all people to himself. So we see something there of Jesus's heart. Secondly, and more in verses 37 and 38, we see our part. Jesus's heart, now our part. What does Jesus want his people to do? First, in verse 37, he describes what he sees. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You see, he could see the vast needs of humanity, and he describes it as a harvest. Now, in the Old Testament, the harvest um, descriptions were usually used of the Day of Judgment, when accounts would be settled, closed, and finalised. But here, the harvest speaks more of opportunity, and yet urgency. I wonder if you think of Glasgow, even if you recognise them as sheep without a shepherd, I wonder if you see Glasgow like this, as a harvest field. Certainly Covid has provided more opportunities for most of us to explain the hope that is in us. But the big problem is the lack of workers. At that stage, Jesus was the only one. But from the beginning of the next chapter, chapter 10, it shows him sending out the 12 into the harvest. And of course, after Pentecost, many more. Secondly, however, what part does he want his followers to play? Verse 38 contains a surprise. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Yes, in chapter 10 and verse 1, uh, it shows him sending out 
But what does he say first? They are to pray, to beg. That is a strong word again, to beg that the Lord of the harvest would thrust out, would throw out more workers into the harvest field. Why does he put prayer first? Well, there are a number of reasons probably. One is that the compassion that we've been talking about leads to prayer. That is the most compassionate thing that we can do. If we do not pray, it's usually because our compassion is defective. And a defective compassion will lead us to focus on secondary solutions. They're good, but they are secondary. Secondly, it emphasises that this needs God. Surrounded, as Jesus was, by the inadequacy of his followers. As J.C. Ryle, bishop uh, from the 19th century, the first bishop of Liverpool, puts it, man can pay agents, universities can give uh, learning, bishops may ordain, congregations may elect, but the Holy Spirit alone can make ministers of the gospel. Now that's not just full-time ministers, but all who are his followers, are ministers. Don Carson, the uh, Canadian um, uh, theologian, said this, I wish I could say that I have always been faithful to that calling, that of prayer. To my shame I have not, but I am convinced that the really great issues before us will be settled on our knees. This does not mean, I repeat, that we should do nothing but pray, it does mean that we should do nothing without praying. If it is true that God customarily uses means, it is no less true that we so often focus on the means that we forget that the really significant work must be God's, or the whole is to no avail. Jesus' heart. Well, we should uh, align our hearts with the compassion of Jesus and see the things as he saw them. Thomas Cranmer, the uh, um, person behind the communion service and much else uh, that is part of our wonderful heritage as Anglican churches, saw the vital importance of the heart. I'm sure some of these phrases will ring in chime in your own memories as I read them. In his comp communion service, he refers to unto whom all hearts are open. Then he goes on later to say, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts. Incline our hearts. Write all these, thy laws, on our hearts. With meek heart and due rever reverence. With hearty repentance. Lift up your hearts. Feed on him in your heart. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. So we need God's, Christ's heart. But our part is to pray for God to work. Now we may find ourselves answering that prayer ourselves as we align with the Father's concern. So in conclusion, I want to refer us actually to um, a foundation which is very connected with St Silas in Glasgow. It's the John G. Payton Foundation, or the John Payton Foundation, which seeks to prepare workers for the harvest field. Well, the first thing that must be done is to pray for workers for the harvest field. And the John Payton Foundation was named after a man from Dumfrieshire who went as a missionary to Vanuatu. It was then known as the New Hebrides in the 19th century. Having first spent 10 very fruitful years in ministry in Glasgow City Mission, here was a man who learned and knew about prayer. He learnt it from his earthly father. He said this um, of he and his uh, siblings, Thither daily and oft times a day, generally after each meal, we saw our father retire 
and shut the door. And we children got to understand by a sort of spiritual instinct, for the thing was too sacred to be talked about, that prayers were being poured out there for us, as of old by the high priest within the veil in the most holy place. We occasionally heard the pathetic echoes of a trembling voice pleading as if for life, and we learned to slip out and in pass in past that door on tiptoe, not to disturb the holy colloquy. Well, Peyton clearly learnt that lesson from his heavenly father and then from his earthly father. And so Peyton himself could say later on in many, many difficulties that he faced in his life, did ever mother run quickly to protect her crying child in danger's hour, then the Lord Jesus hastens to answer believing prayer and send help to his servants in his own good time and way, so far as it shall be for his glory and their good. Well, we know his glory is principally served by people acknowledging the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is. And therefore we should pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out workers into his harvest field. Let's do that now. Our gracious Father and our God, we pray now as a congregation gathered in Glasgow and indeed further afield, that you, the Lord of the harvest, would raise up and send out, fling out workers for the harvest field, both in Glasgow and indeed to the ends of the earth. For we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. Uh, what an encouragement uh, by Bishop Andy there. Uh, and having uh, considered Matthew's uh, great commission for us to go out and spread the good news, uh, at the end of Luke's Gospel, Luke, Dr. Luke, writes a similar uh, commission for us. Uh, and this is what he writes. He says, uh, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Uh, and so part of the Gospel is that repentance for the forgiveness forgiveness of sins. And the Christian life is really the life of repentance, of turning from uh, yourself and turning towards God in trust and obedience. Uh, and so now we'll join together in our homes wherever we go uh, and we'll pray a prayer to God, uh, saying sorry and asking for forgiveness of sins and repenting for the many ways that we failed this week. And most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. And we bring to mind the many ways that we've lived for ourselves uh, this week, seeking to build our own kingdom and not God's kingdom. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And we bring to mind the many ways uh, where we've had this great treasure of the gospel uh, but haven't shared it with our neighbors. Uh, we haven't thought it important enough to tell them this good news. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image uh, to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we're going to continue in our attitude of prayer now as Warren leads us in our intercessions. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow together this evening, please give us a fresh glimpse of who you are. Your word tells us in Psalm 24 
The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Father, Lord Almighty, which of us can approach you by our own efforts? Truly, we have fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, in your compassion and great mercy, you have made a way for sinners to be redeemed and reconciled to yourself. We praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came, who died, and who was raised to life to cleanse us and bring us into right standing with you. We thank you that life abundant, eternal life, is found in him alone. Father, we pray for the world that you have made. How long, O Lord, will things be as they are just now? We think upon the troubles faced by many nations and many people as a result of the coronavirus and the widespread lockdown. Lord, we do not know why this is happening, but we do know that you are our compassionate Heavenly Father. We pray that people across the world would turn to seek you at this time. We pray that you would bring healing and peace to the nations. We pray that those who mourn would find comfort in you, that those who are suffering with ill health would find strength, that those who fear would find courage, and that those who are lonely would find communion with you, our God. In the name of Jesus we ask. Amen. Father, we pray for our mission partners, the Simmons family in Zambia. We thank you for their service with Crosslinks and ask for your continued protection upon them and their health. We pray for guidance for Andy as he seeks to prepare for and teach Bible lessons online. We pray for direction for Rachel and the boys as they seek to commence homeschooling. We pray for wisdom for the Zambian government as they make decisions about healthcare and the future of their country. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Father, closer to home, we turn our thoughts to the United Kingdom. There is so much to pray for. We pray for the government and for those in positions of authority, as you have instructed us, to ask that they may be granted wisdom in making decisions. We pray that you would guide their policies at this time and help them to lead the people well. Lord, we pray for those working with the public, whether in delivery, supermarkets, healthcare, or in other capacities, for your protecting hand. Lord, we think of the impact of the lockdown on households. For many, the experience of lockdown feels mediocre at best. Others long for the freedom to see loved ones. We thank you that this suffering is not unknown to you, and we pray that in your compassion you would bring restoration to the country. Ultimately, we pray that our nation would turn to you and seek you, our God. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. And Father, we pray for the church family here at St Silas. We give thanks that you have gathered us here under the banner of the Gospel. We thank you that together we share in the great hope that is found in Christ alone. Father, we ask that by your Spirit you would be at work here, gathering people to yourself and drawing people into closer fellowship with your Son. Help us to walk more closely with you, our God, through the hearing of your word and by prayer. Purify our hearts. Help us to love our neighbours as ourselves and to be a witness for you in the local community. We seek to know you more and we seek to know how we may serve you, our God. Please be at work in and through this church. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Lord, we lay these matters at the foot of your throne. We thank you for what you have revealed of yourself. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. And we pray your will be done. Amen. Great. Thanks, Warren, uh, for leading us on our intercessions there. Uh, well, hopefully you've had a good time tonight. Hopefully you've been encouraged. Uh, one of the good things about uh, meeting over YouTube and Zoom this time at the moment is that people tune in from all over the place, and I don't know who they are. Uh, there's hundreds of you. Uh, many, many folk who I don't know 
who has been listening in and might be new uh, to St. Silas. Uh, and so if you are someone who's tuned in uh, randomly and you're a relative newcomer to St. Silas, uh, good news, uh, there's an event for you this Monday night, uh, and that's a newcomer's welcome meeting on Zoom. So that's Monday the 18th at 7.45. And if you'd like details about that, uh, please click on the links uh, below for access. Uh, if you're a regular at St. Silas or you've tuned, been tuning into our Zoom services and our YouTube services for a bit, uh, then you might like to fill out our online survey, uh, kind of like our Ofsted report card on how we've been doing on this. And that would be a great aid uh, to us to help uh, do these services better and find out a bit more uh, where you come from. Great, let me close in a final prayer for us. So, Father, we thank you uh, for this time together. Uh, we thank you that we can meet together virtually as your people and hear the good news of the gospel. Please go with us uh, this week, wherever we may be, to live for your praise and glory. Amen.
Blood of Jesus.